to the cloud. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Freed Indeed, where we're joined by Caleb J. Mullins, the great. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to be discussing modalism. So, Caleb, did you happen to see the video that I made on the my biggest concern with modalism? I did, actually. Uh, that was my... Uh... I always pick something to watch while I'm at work because um, I need something to other than just emails to focus on. So right. um, your video was my pick of the day. So, yes, I did watch it. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, if you guys have seen that, you know that I don't consider Molinism to be Christian at all. Uh, I don't believe mm -hmm. it is actually reconcilable with the christian faith and we're going to talk more about that caleb and i are going to try to actually go a step further than i did in that video though and we're not just going to be talking about the biggest problem with molinism but we're really going to try to encapsulate what makes molinism wrong not just what makes molinism different from christianity but why molinism is not true and why christianity is so before we get too far into it, do you want to cover some of the peripheral things, like the fact that from the perspective of most Molinists, God is actually inside of time, not transcending time? Or do you want to mm -hmm. just stick to kind of the bare bones basics of what Molinism is and kind of go from there? No, I, I think we can hit on all that. Uh, okay. I think that that's sort of, I think we can definitely do that within the hour. Um, but yeah, the sort of just coming from my personal perspective. So in your last video, I agree with everything you said. Um, from a historical standpoint, we see nothing like Molinism in any of the fathers, from the early mm -hmm. church fathers uh, to the Nicene fathers, post-Nicene fathers. There's just nothing there. And with the continuance of Orthodox theology, we don't see anything in, a, in our modern saints like St. Paisios right. or, you know, St. Nectarios or St. Seraphim Rose. See what I did there? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it, there? And there's never really any attention paid to Molinism. Right. It seems to be that Molinism is a isolated Western Christian theology. Mm -hmm. And it's not very old. I mean, it, it came about during the counter reformation by Jacques de Molina, you know, who was a Catholic priest, uh, a Jesuit, was he a Jesuit? I can't remember. He was, he was a Jesuit, Jesuit. Yeah. A Jesuit Catholic priest, no, no less who were designed to, you know, the whole purpose of the Jesuits was to pull Protestants back into the fold of the Roman exactly. Catholic church. Right. So you had not only them making, you know, Catholic art revivals and Catholic liturgical revivals, but you had them kind of innovating with theology right. uh, with the Pope's blessing in attempt to reconcile certain non-negotiable Protestant doctrines in a way exactly. that would be palatable to those who would want to come back to Rome. Um, the the exactly. biggest Right. So historically, that's the issue I have is that there's just nothing there that would even make sense of Molinism being patristic, which from an Orthodox Christian standpoint, if it's not patristic, it's likely not Christian either. Right. Um, and from a, a, a metaphysical philosophical perspective, the biggest problem I see with Molinism is the same problem with Calvinism and with Arminianism and with Thomism. And that is that ultimately, Molinism still makes the erroneous assumption that God is in some way subject to time. Mm -hmm. And and this is kind of getting off on a rabbit trail, but maybe we could do this at another time. But all, honestly, I think this is where why the why this happens is because of the Western doctrine of absolute divine simplicity, which comes out of out of Thomism. Um, right. And I and I won't touch on this too much but basically the idea is when you don't distinguish god's energies and essence you don't know how to talk about god being outside of time but yet he does things that are clearly within time and then that it's like but but you know how do you do that when god is so absolutely divinely simple right right 
Um, the other thing I think it does is that I think that Molinism doesn't really safeguard God's sovereignty and doesn't really safeguard human free will. I think it gives the illusion of free will in a lot right. of ways. So I mean, that's it gives my the illusion of both issues. free will and sovereignty, if you think about it, because like, yeah. so for, for those of you who don't know a little bit of the history of Molinism, Molinism exists because of, as Caleb pointed out, Jacques de Molina is a Jesuit priest, and he says, look, so back then you have Lutheranism and then you have Calvinism, and Calvinism has divided at this point into what we today call Calvinism, which is the five points, and Arminianism, which actually, mm -hmm. historically speaking, the five points of Calvinism were really a response to the five points of Arminianism. Nobody prior to Arminius would have considered Calvinism to be summarizable in five points. <laughs> but, and Arminianism is Calvinism's little brother, less right, annoying exactly. little brother. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you have, so what Molina tries to do is basically put Calvinism and Arminianism in a blender and then put a Catholic veneer on it because his hope is that he'll convert Arminians and Calvinists to Molinism. I think what's actually happened is, and Caleb, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that what's actually happened in practice is, thank you very much, is that Calvinists and Arminians don't leave Protestantism, but Molinism becomes kind of this last ditch effort to remain Protestant instead. So it's yes. like it had the exact opposite of Molina's goal. But be that as it may, um, what he's trying to do is say, okay, if we take the Calvinist sort of commitment to divine sovereignty and the Arminian commitment to human free will and put these things together, then we get Molinism. And the way that he tries to do that is through a concept called middle knowledge, wherein he's basically turning God into a universe generator who knows what would happen in any given universe, but create anyway, I, I gave my whole synopsis of Molinism before. I won't rehash right. all of that. But the point is that when what Caleb just said is very important because what Molinism actually does is the opposite. It actually torpedoes any notion of either divine sovereignty or human freedom. Because right. Well, go ahead, Caleb, continue. Yeah, and on, on a side note to that, when you mentioned that this has sort of become the uh, the last ditch effort <laughs> for Protestants <laughs> to remain Protestant. Um, I mean, and within Protestantism, Molinism is pretty fringe, although those who promote it are quite vocal. Uh, right. The most prominent person probably our viewers can think of is William Lane Craig, mm -hmm. for example. And we're um, going to be talking about him quite a bit today, I think. Yes, yes, we will. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I see is that this is a Catholic doctrine in origin, mm -hmm. right? And from an Orthodox standpoint, you know, Catholics have been innovating since 1000 AD. Sorry, Catholics. Um, <laughs> you know, um, so this is not surprising. Uh, but I find it interesting that Protestants, a lot of Protestant modern apologists have latched on to Molinism so hard. And like you said, they haven't gone Catholic. They've sort of become, as I've heard some self-described Molinists say, theological mutts, right? right? Where they're they're Protestant in the fact that they're not Catholic and they're Western Christian, but they're not historically Protestant, and they don't believe anything that historic Protestants believe in any Protestant confession. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see any Catholic apologists today advocate for Molinism. I, I don't. Yeah, very I few mean, and far between. I, uh, yeah, and like supposedly this is a Catholic doctrine, which is okay for you to be a Catholic and hold this doctrine. I don't believe it's ever been refuted, um, but I don't see like Matt Frad. I don't see anybody right. like uh, Trent Horn or uh, uh, you know Jerry Matadix or um, uh, 
Atkins, whatever is, I can't remember his first name, but uh, Jimmy Aiken, yeah. G- Jimmy Aiken, yes. Jimmy Aiken doesn't hold to this. So it's like, it's interesting. I mean, they'll gladly say you can as a Catholic, but they, they're they like, uh, no, no. It, I mean, mostly the overwhelming consensus is Thomism. Right. Um, you know, uh, at least from Catholic apologists side of the counter. Yeah, but, Thomism uh, has never been dethroned as the central, as the essential Catholic teaching, oh, yeah. the essential Catholic vocabulary. And I don't think it ever will. It no. as long as no. the West continues to be Roman Catholic, they'll continue to be Thomists, because you True. can't divorce modern Catholic teaching from Thomism. I don't think. Right, and it's so odd how there's a Protestant revival of Thomism. <laughs> and, and <laughs> it's like wow. It's like it's so funny how much they depend on on Catholic theologians because right. apparently Protestant theologians couldn't come up with this. Um, <laughs> But but I, I'm sorry, I'm getting on a rabbit trail. But yeah, the, the issue of sovereignty and free will is what Molinism claims to preserve, maintain, protect, right? But I think honestly, when you look deeply into it, that's not the case. And like you said, a, a divine universe generator. And then that sort of leaves the door open to the fact that there probably is a multiverse if Molinism is true, right. uh, you know, which is kind of a scary thought. Uh, and I think that the Marvel universe actually actually got on this issue quite well, uh, especially <laughs> with the the series that led up to the last, you know, the final battle against Thanos and all that kind of stuff with Doctor Strange peering into the future. Right. Um, and so, Caleb, way- if yeah. if molinism is true then can you and i become the sorcerer supreme and assistant sorcerer <laughs> supreme and, and so, peer in into the re- multiverse <laughs> in some universe well, i imagine we already are so I mean, <laughs> there you go <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry but but uh, but also uh you know marvel just another side note also hit calvinism pretty hard with the loki series on disney plus <laughs> yeah. that i called that calvinism a, a time and space odyssey but uh the, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, the the issue I see is this: is one, it makes the same mistake as all the other Protestant and Thomistic mm-hmm. doctrines does; is it subjects God to time. But eventually, what happens? Like, let's just take human free will for example. Is I hear Molinists say that God created this particular universe, this particular Earth, because this is the one within which human freedom and divine sovereignty would produ- living together would produce most the most people saved right? right and then when you explain when you ask how that is and i've heard william lane craig say this i've heard plenty of molinists say this is that basically god knows what situation what time what circumstance etc that you could put a person into that they will make likely or will make this certain decision of their own choice. Right. Right. So if we do this all the time as humans, right? Like don't bring this issue up to dad until dad's had a few scotches. Right. Right. <laughs> don't, br- don't bring this issue up to mom until mom is relaxed and in a good mood. You know, you know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or it could be the opposite. Like, Hey, dad's really fired up about this. Now's the time to tell him about this and he'll go hog wild on these guys. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We do this all the time. You know, we wait for the in, the opportune moment to present something to someone because we're making a hedged bet that more likely they're going to do this because they're in that certain mood. Right? Right. And but the problem I have with that is twofold. So the idea is that if God puts a certain person in that certain situation, and that person has this certain background history, and has these certain set of preferences, and is in this certain mood at a certain time, they will definitely make this decision. Right. Then what you've kind of done there is you have reduced human decisions to situational um Situation really situationalism is what I'm getting at, right? It's like had that been a different person with one detail different, they might have made a different decision, right? Or if that person's history was slightly altered. Yes, right. It's like you know, all these things had to be in place in order for this decision to happen. And then you have basically 
human choices being a product a product of experience and a product of you know being in that situation with that certain background at a certain time and place right you exactly. change any of those factors that could radically alter what that person could do so the thing is i'm like if i think about all the decisions i've made up until now right i'm thinking if this one thing had changed different in my life would i have been a different person right that becomes a very scary thought. And a lot of people think that way, you know, man, mm -hmm. if I had just had a better upbringing, I wouldn't have made those decisions. Right. Right. That sort of undermines the very idea of personhood in, right. some, in, in some ways. It becomes almost, you almost become, shall we say, a computer program with a very high functioning algorithm. Right. That given this data I have and given this data I have, if I run into this situation, then I will do this, which has the appearance of freedom, which has the appearance of autonomy. But I think what happens with Molinism is that it's not freedom or autonomy. It's simply a well-written algorithm exactly. at the end of the day. It's not a decision, right? It's a calculated data that feeds through your brain that says, do this, and you don't right. do anything else. And to me, this is just not freedom. It's just the exactly. illusion of freedom. No, yeah. exactly. In fact, this is exactly what um, Calvinist theologians, not hyper-Calvinists, mind you, because um, hyper-Calvinists say that we have no kind of free will whatsoever, and God just exhaustively causes us to do whatever we do. But, you know, actual Calvinists who you meet in Calvinist churches, not just in online forums what they say is essentially exactly what molinists say which is that we don't really have free except they're more honest because they say we don't really have free will we have what's called compatibilism where we are making a choice but that choice is determined by right. external factors so right. then where they go with that is that then god has to exhaustively decree for you to be a christian because if he doesn't you will never make that choice external factors will always pre prevent mm -hmm. you unless god intervenes um so yeah. they're honest that they don't believe in a completely free will whereas molinists mm -hmm. want to retain the term free will but then what they're really teaching is this calvinist notion this classical calvinist notion of right. free will that's not really free um Right. So that's really interesting to me because Molinists hate Calvinism so much, but at the end of the day, they're teaching the exact same notion yeah. of free will. It's just, if anything, I, you can tell me if you think I'm off base here, but if anything, I think that Calvinists are actually just being honest, whereas Molinists are yeah. trying to have their cake and eat it too. It, it does seem it does seem to be that way. That's uh, Somebody needs to make a meme of... Uh of uh, adam where he's touching god's finger but put on <laughs> put on adam calvin put on god molinism and then put the touching point uh compatibilism <laughs> that's where they that's where they touch fingers right um right or compatibilism so, molinist free will and then jenna fisher it's the same picture <laughs> right it does, it does seem to yeah in that respect it does seem to be that that way and then the the flip side of that with Molinism's claim to maintaining God's sovereignty, I don't think that's true either, because right. you have now, of course, we as Orthodox Christians are going to define, define sovereignty differently than a Calvinist will. A Calvinist would say, for example, that God has to be completely meticulously causing things to happen in right. order for that to we wouldn't say that we'd say god has reign over everything and can intervene and can do things so as he pleases but it doesn't necessarily doesn't equate that he will right right um so but you you have for example william lane craig who says things like god is simply dealing with the cards he's dealt right right and what you have what he means by that is that he kind of sees human freedom and god's sovereignty as a logical conundrum in some respects right. which is i get the idea right well it's only a it's only a logical problem if you have and i pointed this out in mm -hmm. uh that other video but it's only a logical problem if you assume 
a certain right. notion of sovereignty and a certain notion of free Correct. will, then it Correct. becomes a logical contradiction. But you don't have to assume that, you know, actually, I'm glad you brought up that dealing with the cards he's dealt thing, because I really loved, even though he's definitely not orthodox, I did love Dr. James White's response to that when William Lane Craig said it, <laughs> yes. he said, well, then I'm going to worship the one dealing the cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, just to throw the Molinists a bone here, I do think they are in one respect right. And that is that the idea that if you're going to have creatures who are actually free, right, human beings, mm -hmm. for example, and you're going to have a God that is truly sovereign and you're going to create a world based on the reciprocating of love between created beings and an uncreated being right. there is and i'm saying this from a human perspective the chances of something going wrong on the part of the created beings who are imperfect is very likely right right so there is this sense and where that if you want that sort of thing it may be in some sense that we can't explain that evil occurring may be inevitable okay not that god couldn't stop it of course he could he just wouldn't do right. anything right but it could be that you know that's what necess what necessitates that sort of thing because there has to be some sort of opposition at the end of the day there has to be an right. actual choice to reject or to accept right exactly um right so in some sense that is correct but I think what they do is they take that a step further, the Molinists, and they say that this world is the best one. I'm like, this is the best, <laughs> you know, this right. world is the best one God could have created. He couldn't have created a world where every, that's the scary part. He couldn't have created a world where everybody freely chooses him. Right. That's the part that's confusing Yikes. to me is if we're saying that god and this is actually something cheryl brought up when i was doing the prep work for the last thing she brought up well if god is truly sovereign and truly sees all things then and has this middle knowledge then why doesn't he he's trying to create the universe with the most people getting saved why doesn't he just create a universe where everybody gets saved like it's very right. odd um but yeah. like you said that's the problem because they really don't believe that god is sovereign or capable of intervening in all things that they, they don't really believe that um mm -hmm. they believe more so i mean what is their notion of sovereignty because that's something that i mean they have their notion of free will they expound on pretty clearly but i don't see them as clearly discussing sovereignty as often so and when they do it's like very nebulous concepts so what exactly do they actually mean right and i think the other problem is that maybe maybe this is something i don't know if we should pursue or not but sort of when you talk about god and possibility right yeah to, to me that's strangely foreign that god has potentiality right right it's like that the, okay let me give you a perfect comic book example here sure. um th there was a big debate like back about 10 years ago between comic book nerds like who would win in a fight superman or goku mm -hmm. right from dragon ball z and you had raging fans on both sides of the aisle but it's like it's been examined like i think by three different three different times right and two out of the three times um they said superman will win more than likely and the answer is that goku is a man with potential who is trying to become a god right a super saiyan god right you know right superman is a god learning to live like a man he's already at he's already at his full potential there's nothing more for superman to learn 
right? He right. can't learn to be more powerful, right? He is at his full potential. Whereas Goku is pursuing that full potential. And as far as we've seen in, in Dragon Ball Z, Goku has never reached that point. He's constantly training, constantly pursuing, right? Right. Um, good picture of Theosis when you think about it. Um, yeah. But, but uh, you know, that's kind of like what I find interesting here with Molinism is it seems to at least imply that God has potentiality right. to do something or not do something um, and things like that. And I'm like, God doesn't really have potentiality. He, he just is right. right. And he's at his full strength. He's at his full exactly. power. So, you know, it, dealing with the cards he's dealt, I mean, gracious and possible worlds that God right. could have done differently it's like exactly hmm. the idea of different possible worlds and the idea that god could have done something different it does sort of well i would say it challenges the very notion of god as we know him as being impassable in his essence yes because yes. which if you remove the essence and i think again part of the problem here is they don't have right. the essence energy distinction so for them they can only because they don't have the essence energy distinction they're not they don't have a category for exploring like how god can interact with the world but yet his essence be forever unchanging right but nevertheless this is what we see uh, especially mm -hmm. if you read the bible in greek then you know that you know god's energies are talked about in scripture right but either way you know i the lord change not that's when god says that i the lord change not he's not describing himself as an entity who has potentials and possibilities and could right. do one thing but instead does another thing god is always god he is what he is that's why when abraham or i mean sorry when moses asks god his name god says i am that i am like god is right. he and yeah. because god is he he doesn't just do he is and i think that's an important distinction like you and i we mm -hmm. interact with the world and we have possibilities and potentials and we sometimes meet our full potential we sometimes don't we sometimes do one thing we sometimes do another thing we succeed and we fail god has no god can't fail god right. can't you know there's no scenario in which god fails there's no possibilities there's no potentials in god he is and he is perfect and he is beyond any human ideal and i think right. molinism just really fails to capture that idea i i agree I, I think it's it makes god subject to something greater than himself the whole you know dealing with the the cards that he's dealt um and then it ends up being possible like you said possibility and impassibility seems to go out the door and i've heard molinists tell me oh i don't believe in an impassibility of god right and and it's bad enough that they believe in absolute divine simplicity, but it's worse when they say God is passable. It's like it's mm -hmm. a worse or heresy than absolute divine simplicity, you know, whenever they begin to say that, oh, God actually is passable. And I'm like, right. oh, yikes, you know, um, exactly. you have a God who could change his mind and, and all that kind of stuff. Or At that point, to... it's just open theism. <laughs> yeah. And see, not to go on this rabbit trail, but it seems like there is a definite link between doctrine the th what i call the three modern or the three modern heresies between molinism um open theism and annihilationism i mean mm -hmm. it, it's funny because annihilationism isn't that old isn't that young um there right. are, there were a few people who lived during the early church that seemed to believe in something like that um but at the end of the day, yeah, it seems very, very, I don't know. It just seems like those two, all those three are always together for some reason. Right. I've yet to meet somebody, I've yet to meet somebody who, who believes in all three. Uh, but I, it seems like there's a, a thread that goes through right. those things. And I would even throw in universalism to, to some extent yeah. as well. But um, that's they not do. a they, young they heresy have, either. So. 
they all have very similar arguments attached to them they yeah. all have very sim- i mean even like i've actually said this too that universalism and calvinism actually have this bizarre brotherhood mm-hmm. because yeah. it's comical when you talk to when you've done apologetics for a while you start to notice that if you're doing apologetics with Calvinists or with Universalists, you hear the exact same arguments. Well, if God wants to save everyone and doesn't, then that means you believe in a God who fails. I don't believe in a God who fails. Therefore, insert my heresy, whether it's uh, therefore Calvinism, God doesn't actually want to save everyone, or Universalism, yeah. God doesn't actually fail to save anyone. Um, right. Which, by the way, we don't believe that God fails. That's, again, that's not yeah. the correct way yeah. of looking at that. Um, right, but, because he's getting his way either way, whether the right. person is saved or not. Because, well, maybe we should tell this to our viewers, because I'm sure we've got some Calvinist viewers who are like, how do you say God doesn't fail and not everybody's going to be saved? And I'm like, well, here's the thing. He did want human beings to have free will. That's right. You know, so he's not failing there even if the consequences are not favorable towards him, he's still not failing. He wanted them to have free will. He wanted the relationship to be between two, you know, autonomous free beings. But then the other thing is when you understand that everyone gets resurrected Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's right. that, That Christ's death, which defeats death and makes, you know, Sheol and Hades empty. Right. That's right. Has, you know, complete, that's true for everyone. That's true for every Christian. That's true for every atheist. That's true for every Muslim, Buddhist, pagan, whatever it is you happen to be, right? But the difference at the end of the day is, so you are going to be resurrected. You're going to feel the same exact divine fire that I'm going to feel, That's right. that Kevin's going to feel, that every Molinist is going to feel, that every Catholic, whatever, is going to feel. The difference is, is that your freedom, which is a gift to you from God, is going to determine how you're going to receive that and That's how right. you're going to experience that. So in a way, universal salvation in the sense that you are not going to die again and that you are going to be united with your creator, whether you, not, you like it or not, um, That's right. the difference at the end of the day is subjective on how you're mm-hmm. going to get to that point. So God is not losing here. He's not losing exactly. at all. <laughs> and no. another thing too, is that God succeeds in that everything is going to be put into its right relationship with God. Right. The, mm-hmm. the question is not, will you be in right relationship to God? The question is what will be your right relationship to God and if we've chosen a life of sin and a life of degradation, then our right relationship with God is yeah, ultimately torment, unfortunately. And so that's where eternal conscious torment comes in. And that's why Jesus tells us that we should fear him who will cast us into hell. It's not because we should be sitting there being afraid of God and being like, oh, God is mean or whatever. No, We should Mm -hmm. be afraid because of the fact that if we choose a life of sin, then we are making ourselves into a person who is going to be, uh, who's going to experience God as a consuming fire, because ultimately that's the relationship with God that you've chosen. But there is no possibility of being outside of relationship with God. So, yeah, everything is going to be put right and put in order. Justice Mm -hmm. is accomplished. And um, and so, you know, I wanted to before we get too far off of it, you made a comment that Mm -hmm. um, that these Western philosophies, including Molinism, um, subject God to time. I was wondering Mm -hmm. if you could elaborate on that a little bit more because right um i've definitely encountered this but i think that a lot of people don't um mm-hmm. a lot of people don't deal with that implication and so they'll 
they'll object and say, well, I believe Thomism and I don't believe that God is subject to time, or I believe Calvinism and I don't believe God is subject to time, or even I believe Molinism and I don't believe God is subject to time. Although that one's pretty rare. I've noticed that mo- the vast majority yeah. of Molinists, Molinists think say God that, yeah. is subject to time. Yeah. William Lane Craig so, openly says that. Yeah, yeah he William openly Lane Craig, says yeah, that. exactly. In fact, uh, yeah. I have a couple of his books where he argues for Molinism, and it's interesting that that's that is actually one of the first things he argues for is that God is subject to time. And then he only tries to establish Molinism after that. So I do yeah. think that the people who say that you don't need God to be subject to time to be Molinists, I do think that's slightly di- um, disingenuous, but I think that they can be being sincere in believing that they they could be deceiving themselves. So right. can you elaborate on that a little bit? How is maybe Molinism in particular, but even these Western philosophies in general, how are they subjecting God to time? And how would you refute that? How would you show that God isn't subject to time? Sure. So like, no matter what position you take, Molinist, Arminian, or Calvinist, they all assume that time is linear, right? There's a past, a present, and a future, right? And they assume that this type of linear time that we experience in our physical reality, which I don't deny we do experience time in that way, but the assumption they make that gets them in trouble is that the unseen realm experiences time in that exact same way. This is why you will have, for example, uh, You'll have Calvinists who say that God, that Christ can't be physically present in the Eucharist because he is at his body is at the right hand of the Father right now. Right. And my question is for a God who's timeless and a God who doesn't age, doesn't get hungry, doesn't, you know, Mm -hmm. all those sort of things. What what time is it in heaven? (laughs) Right. What 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 where what what does time mean in a place where there's no sun and no moon and no Mm -hmm. stars and and no revolving planets and and things like that? Right. I I think it's a silly question at the end of the day, and it's a silly even sillier assumption uh, at the end of the day, because when you have the Arminian, the Arminian basically makes God a a guy looking into a crystal ball, really, at the end of the day, you have him looking ahead of time to see who will accept him and then predestining those people to salvation. You uh, Calvinists, you know, kind of do the opposite. You have God who knows everything that's going to happen after he, after he creates something, right? This is the super lapsarian sort of, uh, sort of thing, right? Right. Um, and yet he, chooses the people he's going to save unconditionally regardless as to what they do in life right and with the molinists you have sort of the same idea and like we said craig the biggest proponent for molinism right now um has unapologetically said god is subject to time because he's working around this past present future sort of model right and i i just i like i said i think it's silly and I think it's unwarranted, and I think it has no basis other than I think this is what works uh, to say that God and the unseen realm, angels, demons, all that, and all kinds of bodiless spirits are subject to time, right? Right. Um, and honestly, time is kind of what makes things die when you think about right. it. Right, exactly. Um, and I think you get hints of this in some of the fathers where basically when adam and eve fall all of a sudden they become subject to time right. and decay and things like that um whereas may, well i should take that back i think that when they were created they were certainly subject to time right as linear time as we know it but that was never their telos that was right. never their destiny they they were to be in the same realm that the angels and god himself was exactly. in once theosis was realized and we get that with jesus christ when he resurrects because you know he still has the same scars but he's not and it's funny because the greek conveys its fresh wounds right (laughs) but they're not bleeding right Mm -hmm. so you have but he can still eat and he can still do all these things but you know something is different about him exactly and he's and he's going to come back 
in a way that's both recognizable but different. I think this is the state. This is the status that we should have reached as you know Adam and Eve, and as the descendants of Adam and Eve. Um, so you know that. So we're sort of trapped in this linear time, which animals were already subject to. You know, there's right. no indication that animals were ever supposed to be out of this. You know, they're not theosified beings, right? Exactly. Um, right. And so you have this idea that we weren't ever supposed to be in linear time. And so I think they're trying to redeem time in a way that's not helpful, especially when you consider theosis and you consider the resurrected Christ and you consider what it means to be a bodiless, eternal, immortal being. Right. right. And to offer a positive reason to believe that we is to simply look at orthodox iconography in the light of scripture so when you look at the creation of the world you see jesus is actually creating the world he's uh -huh. in the form that we depict him in christ the teacher wearing the blue and red robes of royalty mm -hmm. and some he's got a square and compass like actually measuring yeah. out the the parts of the world which i'm like yeah you don't get that in the Gen genesis narrative but i'm like that would be so cool to think that yeah he, you know, measured things out you know but you've got christ the man doing right. this the idea of a pre-incarnate christ doesn't make sense to an orthodox mind right you know and so you have, I mean, it clearly says God was walking with Adam with and Eve, Adam in, the and Eve cool in the garden. And the way the West does this is they just say, oh, that's an anthropomorphism. I'm like, no, that's because God is anthropomorphic. Right. Well, <laughs> right. but they have to say that it's an anthropomorphism because in the West, again, they don't have the concept of the divine essence and energies distinction. Correct. But also they've lost the concept of the divine the two powers in heaven basically because they allow modern right. Jews to dictate to them that they, they kind of it's weird because an, a lot of times in the west you see like anti-semitism but at the yeah. same time i think it's ironic that they're sort of anti-semitic but then they also do this thing where they're like but the Jews that you encounter in the synagogue down the street from your house believe the same thing that the Pharisees believed in Jesus's time. And it's like, no, yeah. that's just, that's fundamentally not true. So right. in Jesus's time, there was a concept called the two powers in heaven. And if you believe the two powers in heaven, then it makes sense that God was walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day because God can be physically present Mm -hmm. And also he can be in heaven because God is not just one person, but God is actually um, multiple, multiple yeah. people. God, there's one God, but that one God exists as different persons. And that's why throughout the Old Testament, you see these examples where it says things like Yahweh took fire from Yahweh and threw it down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> well, it's not the ancient Jews didn't believe that God was standing there holding fire in his left hand and put it in his right hand because he could throw better <laughs> that way. Um, that's not, he's not like a baseball player, you know? <laughs> um, that's not what's going on. So it's right. very clear. And even, you know, some modern Jews have kind of resurrected this concept to a degree. Um, Rabbi but, Akiva believed it. Yeah, and... Rabbi Akiva believed it, but yeah. the reason why modern Jews reject it by their own admission is because it's too close to the Christian notion of the Trinity by their own admission. And if you think I'm lying, go ahead and read um, what's his name? The one who the book called the, the two powers yeah, in heaven, the two yeah. powers in heaven. Um, go ahead and read that book. He says that the Jews in, I believe it was the second century, um, ended and, up having a council where they re rejected this concept in favor of absolute monotheism because of Christianity. So, um, yeah. And they so, rejected all of the deuterocanonical books too, which had right. been, and the exactly. apocryphal books, which had been huge part of the Jewish tradition exactly. for a long time. Um, because they said they're too Christian. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
So yeah, don't throw it, those books yeah. out, Protestants, because they're Christian. But here's yeah. here's why I bring up the Jews, though. I, I'm not bringing up the Jews just to throw shade on on the synagogue. I'm bringing up the Jews because the problem in the West is that uh, with regard to this concept where they're like, oh, well, it has to be an anthropomorphism. It only has to be an anthropomorphism because you're allowing non-Christians to dictate how you approach the Bible. And we don't need to do yeah. that. We don't need to right. allow people outside of the church to dictate how we approach scripture. So um, right. and so the I same thing happens with God and time. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I would even go a step further and say that uh, a lot of Western Christians are influenced by Islam. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, I think there is a very clear thread from Aquinas, who was reading Muslim scholars quite mm -hmm. a bit and trying to have conversations with Muslim scholars a lot. And uh, you did a video on this. It was the video of uh, Father Stephen Freeman's article, Has That's Your right. Bible Become the Quran? Mm -hmm. There is a definite thread of islamic theology from which things like absolute divine simplicity and god being actus purus and things like and in a way subject to time because of the uh the islamic doctrine of predestination is pretty much That's almost right. a mirror image of calvinism um, I think that pe people really don't realize that historic thread that's really influenced a lot of western christianity post 700 AD um, in a lot of mm -hmm. ways um and uh, the, the other thing is that, like you said, in the Bible, we get all these instances where Samuel's called by God, and it says that he goes back to his room and says for the third time, you know, here, here I am, Lord, your servant speaks, you know, or your servant listens. And it says, behold, a man stood at the foot of his bed. That's right. And so you have Abraham literally inviting God to dinner and God eating the food he makes him. Exactly. <laughs> and then you have, you have, uh, Moses, when he strikes the rock, God says, I will stand on the rock that you will strike. And you have the song of the sea where it says God is a man of war, where exactly. they saw Yahweh dressed in armor, carrying a weapon, leading them through the Red Sea and then turning around and causing the waters to crash on the Pharaoh at Moses' signal. Um, right. You've got the quote, angel of the Lord, um, you know, appearing before Joshua as a man dressed in armor with a sword. I mean, you've got all these instances of Christ, and I mean, wrestling with Jacob, you know. Uh, and then you've got, of course, my favorite example of this is the, uh, the transfiguration at Mount Tabor, mm -hmm. where you have Peter, James, and John with Christ, and then all of a sudden Jesus is talking with uh with uh, saint elijah and moses the god seer on mm -hmm. mount sinai and i've always heard as a protestant you know what were they talking about you know and and all that good stuff and i've heard plenty of explanations for why this is but i think what they really miss is that that instance is the same exact historical event as elijah talking with god on mount sinai when he hears god in the still small voice this is also Moses talking to Christ in the burning bush. It's the same exact event. Right. People are like, well, what were, what were they talking about? I said, hey, go read the story of the burning bush and go read the story of Elijah talking with God on Mount Sinai. Then you'll know what Jesus was talking about with Moses and Elijah. That's right. And of course they were stunned by this, James, John, and Peter, you know, and it's like, for that one most moment when he's transfigured as Yahweh, the God of war and lightning and all this stuff we read about in the Psalms, right? That they see the God of their ancestors doing what they've only heard the rabbis talk about in That's the synagogue. Right. People don't realize how significant this is. So this is showing that time means nothing to him. That's right. And, and when you start to think about time as being this layered sort of um I, I really don't know how to put it but it's just this timelessness that has no up or down right. or left or right the idea of like well how do you know you know of questions of salvation that you see in western models become moot points right really well and the idea of time the way that 
I mean, the way that God sees time versus the way that we see time. And, and here's the thing to understand that what we're saying is not that linear time is incorrect. What we're saying no. is that linear no. time is how human beings perceive time, but and linear animals. time is not right. And animals, but linear. So well, we're actually, not they don't saying... know about time, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're yeah. not saying that, you know, um, we're not saying that you can be born in 1994 and die in 1864. That's not That'd what we're cool. saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we're saying. Um, we're not saying that 1864 is going to happen again. None of that. What we're saying is that fundamentally, when God perceives time, he doesn't perceive time as linear, but he perceives everything all at once. Um, and he's totally present in everything all at once as well. It's not like God has to decide whether he's going to hear Caleb's prayers or my prayers because we're praying at the same time and he can only listen to one of us. No, God is fully and completely present in mm -hmm. both Caleb and my prayer time and fully present in all times and in all places. And this is why in our divine liturgy, we say that God is everywhere present and fillest all things. That doesn't mm -hmm. just mean that God is physically everywhere present and filling all things. That's true as well. But it also pertains to time as well, that God is in every time and space and all things filling all things. So, yep. and that is fundamentally important because like Caleb said, this is an issue that you can't get it. I don't think you can get around it with Thomism or Calvinism either, but at least with Thomism and Calvinism, they can kind of say, well, it's not fundamental to our system, but it really seems that with Molinism, it is fundamental to the system because Correct. when you read the Molinist literature, like William Lane Craig, they're very much um, establishing this as important and i've yet to meet a molinist who didn't believe that god was subject to time by the way um yeah so and it's interesting too because i remember when i was um talking to a seventh day adventist one time and they because of their view of the sabbath they were kind of talking about keeping the sabbath in heaven and so i asked them caleb's question i said well what time is that in heaven it, if there's no it, if there's no sun and no moon how are you determining when the sabbath is in heaven and he was totally stumped by that um now i thought later while watching jonathan peugeot that he could have said well whatever time it is in jerusalem um because in the hebrew cosmology jerusalem is the center of the cosmos um but right. fortunately he does fortunately seventh day adventists don't know anything about hebrew cosmology so i didn't have to worry about him saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah sometimes you have to play to your opponent's ignorance <laughs> but right. in all seriousness um in all seriousness though there is no time in in god um, God right. is in all times. And so even the idea of whatever time it is in Jerusalem, that's human perspectives talking. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. we have This is how we perceive time. I'm not saying stop perceiving time that way. You can't. That's the only way you can perceive time. But we're saying that God doesn't have to perceive time that way. And if you say that God does have to perceive time that way, then you're subjecting God to human categories. And there's no reason to do that. God is not subject to our categories. Correct. Correct. And God isn't subject to our notion of potentials and possibilities either. And that goes back to what we were talking about before. But I think this issue really... Uh, I think this issue brings us back to that because this again would make God subject to potentials and possibilities. Is God going to um, be in this time or that time? Could God go back and do things differently in the past? Could God learn from the past as open theists 
openly teach that God is actually, or uh, I guess that's actually called process theology. I apologize. Um, in process theology, they say that God is actually learning just like we are. And so, you know, you, yeah. if you make God subject to time, then there's no reason why that couldn't be the case. Or Am I right? Yeah, I, it's funny you bring up the process theology thing, because in some ways, I could see where neo-Marcionites would love that idea. Yes! Because, because they would be like, well, God was real angry, he was a war god, he was very tribalistic, he practiced genocide and all that right. kind of stuff. But you know, he learned he over learned time. From his mistakes. <laughs> he learned from his mistakes, and, and now we have with Jesus, we got nice God. We got right. Jesus, the God your grandmother loves to talk about, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like, ah, no. Right. No. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it is, it does become an issue, though, of if you're not worshiping the same God as King David, then how yeah. can we say that we're in continuity with <laughs> King David? And if and this is a problem that I actually want to pose to people in the West in general, but especially to Molinists, because, um, and I'll get to why it especially applies to Molinists, but to people in the West in general, because if you think that King David was this monotheist who didn't believe in a trinity, who didn't believe in the two powers in heaven, you think that King David was just like, your local synagogue of Jews, then how are you really worshiping the same God that he worshiped? It makes no sense. And yep. if you're not worshiping the same God that he worshiped, then in what way can you be in continuity with him? And then to the Molinist, I would ask the same question, but it becomes even more severe because now you don't even have the same God that the church fathers worshiped. So you don't have the same God that the apostles taught St. Clement yeah. of Rome, for example, was the direct apostle of St. Peter and St. John. So how are we going to say if if the God I'm describing is completely different from the God he's describing, how can I say that I am a Christian because clearly I'm not worshiping the same God that the apostles taught St. Clement to worship? So, yeah. Caleb, what uh, kind of... Walk me through that. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and this is something with uh, the more I, I listen to uh, Father Stephen DeYoung's material, mm -hmm. for example. Um, I mean, to me, that man is probably the best Orthodox theologian we have concerning biblical theology today. Um, mm -hmm. So, Father Stephen, yeah, I just really fanboyed for you right there. Uh, <laughs> couldn't, help, couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know... You know, he uh, he was saying that at one point, you'll see where I'm going with this in a second, but he was saying that, you know, he was a Dutch Reformed pastor at one point mm -hmm. in his life. And he said now that he's been an Orthodox priest, you know, for 20 plus years, I think he said 20 plus years. Anyway, he said that he never he never misses a chance to take a pot shot at Calvinism. <laughs> right? He said, because he said, I've been in the room as a Dutch Reformed pastor when Calvinists die. And I've been in the room with mm -hmm. um, with Orthodox Christians when they die, and he's like, I've yet to be in a room with a Calvinist when they die that were that they were not terrified to die. For all their talk of assurance, they're terrified they're going to hell. Whereas in Orthodoxy, we don't have certainty of assurance, but we have hope. That's you know, right. blessed hope. Um, he said the difference is astounding, and he ended that with saying, "It's hard for me to say." that Calvinists and Orthodox Christians worship the same God, because I don't think we do. Right. And I, I feel that way about Molinism. I, I really do. I just, I'm not trying to be mean and scream, you're a damned heretic or, or anything like that. I mean, I do believe it's a heretical doctrine, but I do that with a lot of regret and sadness that I can't say that Molinists are actual Christians in right. a historic sense at all. Um, but it wouldn't be me who just says that too. Historic Protestantism. If you That's right. if you if you have a you know a confessional Lutheran or, or any confessional Calvinist or Anglican, they would not say Molinism 
is right. uh, is Christian if they are truly holding to their confession, right? And I I feel that way too that 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 the God presented in Molinism and Calvinism, for that matter, is just not the same God right. that I know, and just not the same God that the fathers would have confessed. It just it's so foreign. It seems to me that a lot of Molinist apologists are are it's almost like their version of christianity is not a religion it's a philosophy yes exactly yeah. which actually it's... that brings me to another point and that is molinism you're exactly right molinism is not a theology it's a mm-hmm. philosophy and right. it's it's not a religion which is why um it's actually the same as seed of acantism within roman catholicism have you ever noticed that right. there is no such thing as a seat of vacantist church? Like go to any, talk to any yeah. seat of vacantist, ask him where he goes to church and he either doesn't or he attends just some Roman Catholic church and is a seat yeah. of vacantist in his own personal convictions because yeah. there is no such thing as a seat of vacantist church. It's the same way with Molinism. There is no such right. thing as a Molinist church. You can have Molinist pastors, but there is no such thing as a Molinist church. What you have is a Baptist or I don't, maybe they're all Baptists. Actually, I've never seen a Molinist Presbyterian, but for the sake of argument, what you have is like a Molinist Baptist, a Molinist charismatic, a Molinist Presbyterian. And this is why, by the way, when you meet Molinists, they say things like, well, I'm a theological mutt. Yeah, you have to be because you aren't really part of any church. You aren't under any right. um, confession yeah. of faith. I mean, at least with – if I'm talking to a Calvinist, I can at least talk to them about where they'll say, okay, you know, I have the Westminster Standards or the 39 the three, for, three forms or of unity or – three forms yeah. of unity. There's Belgian something that I yeah. can look to and say – okay, here's, we're discussing these points. With Molinists, you can't do that because there is no such thing as a Molinist church. It's all right. just this philosophy. And I right. also think that that's part of why most Molinists you meet are so arrogant because they think that yeah. they're smarter than everybody. Um, and they think right. that because it's just this philosophy right. and when and, when your whole yeah. religion is just a yeah. philosophy it's all about just being the smartest guy in the room not about trying right. to actually attain holiness or humility yeah and that's the that's the thing and i'm sure there's plenty of of perfectly nice molinists out there i'm not saying there's not but right i just haven't there met them. right i haven't either <laughs> um and and that and that yeah like i said it's almost I feel a lot when I talk to Molinists because it seems like the Molinists I meet are also those who don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture either. Right. Um, and they, and to me, it just, it feels like I'm talking to a deist in some right. ways, uh, a deist with, with Christian beliefs in some ways. I'm not saying they are deist. I'm saying that the vibe in the room you right. get from a Molinist is the same vibe I get from deists, which is it's a very philosophical, it's a very intellectual pursuit of some kind. And it feels like they're trying to create a Christian philosophy that has no religious ritual or things like that, which is why right. I think you end up with guys like William Lane Craig and others who are like non-denominational or Baptist of some stripe. Right. Right. That are that are they're not like confessional Lutherans. They're not uh, anything like that. Right. And the, the analogy with Calvinism, like, yeah, I can go to a Calvinist church that's confessionally Calvinist. You have Dutch Reform, Presbyterian, you know, uh, you know, some Anglicans. Right. I, I could do the same thing with Arminians. I could go to a Methodist church. Um, I could go to your run of the mill SBC church, which is functionally Arminian. Um, right. I, I can't do that with Molinism. There's no first Molinist church. There's right. no, yeah, I think that that's sort of the danger of a doctrine like this is that you end up with something that that enters into the conversation with Arminianism and Thomism and Calvinism, but 
at the end of the day doesn't really go anywhere and i think that's i mean honestly if we're going to go historic wise you should end up a catholic but the fact that the catholic church is overwhelmingly 98 percent or more thomas right it's like you would be welcomed but you would be the weirdest catholic in the world but i think that's the thing is now you're seeing that the mo- the majority of Molinists, as few as there are, are not Catholic. Mm-hmm. They're non-denominational evangelicals of some type. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. My wife and I were joking the other day. She said that she was wondering if maybe the real reason why Molina came up with this was just to see how many Protestants he could make believe something dumb and make Protestants look bad. Right. Because right. he was it, a it Jesuit, does- you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised he would give up Thomism as much as the Jesuits today are, in fact, um, you know, Thomists in that regard. Right. But yeah, it makes no sense to me. But uh, I noticed we're at the uh, we're all, we're past the hour mark. If we want to see if we have any questions from anybody. Yeah, let's or... see. Uh, we somebody asked if they could ask a question before, but yeah. now I'm not seeing. Nobody in the chat? Okay. Do you want to ask a question? Because it looks like the we had somebody in the chat, but it looks like he left, so he might have had something else going on. But uh, yeah. otherwise, I guess to buy to buy him a little bit of time, I'll bring up one more thing which is why do you think and this is one that kind of baffles me a little bit why do you think so many molinists are against the idea of the inerrancy of scripture Mm. because that one's confusing to me because on the one hand they say that they're protestants but then Mm -hmm. they're against the um so is that just like they don't want to be under authority or what's that about I I mean to me it it makes logical sense that they wouldn't believe in the inerrancy of scripture because like I said Molinism is a philosophy at the end of the day it's not right. a confession or or any sort of theological grounding uh, in any sort of way so it seems uh, logical that that you would want to have that same sort of shall we say freedom when examining scripture if it doesn't make logical sense. Um, to you or philosophical sense in one way or another to to do that um i don't think maybe that's true for all molinists um, right but it seems that is a trend it's kind of like how you have uh, post-millennial guys who um you know who are also theonomists right, right. Um, you could be post-mill and not a theonomist but you cannot be a theonomist and not be post-mill right it does, right you know i think it's sort of the same same idea you could be a molinist and not deny the inerrancy of scripture but you could not be but you cannot be a person who denies the inerrancy of scripture well actually you could you could be an atheist so i guess that doesn't work so well <laughs> um but uh, it's funny they don't even try the whole prima scriptura route that uh, a lot of uh, episcopals and methodists right. do where they where they uh reject something like you know sola scriptura rightly so um but then insert something like prima scriptura i mean why not try the route of like well the bible is an errant in doctrine right but may not but may not be an errant in timeline or, or whatever right right um right and so you know i don't know why that is but i've I've often found that most uh molinists i've encountered generally do not believe in the inerrancy of scripture which how do you then say it's divinely inspired if you get that exactly okay All right, oh so there's avery avery is back he wanted to ask a question let's see if he yeah wants to come on okay he says let's see if i can show his um thing here he says so I subscribe to the best of all possible worlds argument. What do you think of this argument? We kind of touched on that earlier. Um, yes. So what we were saying is that it, so in orthodoxy, we don't believe 
in possibilities with God. God is, uh, God is what He is. There's no mm -hmm. sort of possibility. There's no possible world. There is what is, and mm -hmm. that is that is God. Um, uh, cool. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna interject real quick. So sure. Um, so I do subscribe to the best of all possible wor worlds argument. Um, I think that this world that we live in is like the the best ideal possible world that God could have and did create. Hmm. Because okay. there's no other planet like Earth. So like all out of all the planets God could have possibly created, God chose to freely create this particular planet the way that he did. So in right. this case, it would be the best of all possible worlds. Like the most ideal situation, basically. Hmm. I mean, I... The, so the I think issue this I is the best planet. Um, I think this is the <laughs> yeah, best I mean, planet that God... No, I mean, by, by that, I mean, like... But that I mean, like out of all the possible worlds that God could have created, like for instance, God could have God could have chose Mars to be habitable, habit, habitable, but He didn't. He He chose Earth to be the ideal planet that would He would choose to sustain to put people on it, sustain life. So, like in my in 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 my reasoning, this this is indeed the best of all possible situations and or or worlds that God could have chose to create and he chose to actualize and create earth basically so i think there might be a confusion here between i think so yeah we're not talking about things. that necessarily right we're, so we're we're mm, talking about the idea ahead. of like multiverses for example right the idea yeah, that I, I subscribe to the idea right. of the multiverse and we don't yeah orthodoxy don't. does yeah. not subscribe to that so here's but so when you you're talking about like earth versus mars you know, that gets into the fine tuning of the universe and the fact that there's only a certain subset of criteria under which life can actually exist on a planet. And obviously we believe that because that's just a scientific fact. You can't mm -hmm. have life on it. There's a very narrow window of possibilities in which life can arise and God has perfectly tuned the universe to exactly meet those criteria so that Earth can have life. That's not what we're right. talking about when we talk about possible worlds with regards to Molinism. With regards to Molinism, what that's talking about is what they call middle knowledge. So it's the idea that God could have created the world in such a way that there would have been blue bunny rabbits instead of white bunny rabbits. But he instead <laughs> chose to create the world with white bunny rabbits because he foresaw that somehow having blue bunny rabbits might result in fewer people being Christians. Whereas if yeah. bunny rabbits are white, then um, more people will be Christians. So that's the kind of right. possible worlds that Molinism right. is talking about. And that's what we were rejecting. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I do have one more question to ask. Okay. Um, I noticed you guys, I did hear you guys that you guys brought up uh, post millennialism. I know this is really, I'm not related to Molinism, but um, sure. I am actually a post millennialist. So, like, I, I, I would love to know your guys' thoughts on that. So, I think with post, with regards to post millennialism, there's different. There's different approaches to the topic of post-millennialism. If by post-millennialism someone simply means that the church will ultimately win, then I don't have a problem with post-millennialism. No, not at all. Um, if what they mean is that we should be establishing Christian institutions and believe that God is going to bless us and cause those institutions to be successful – then again, I, I don't have a problem with post-millennialism. This is the sort of thing we pray for all the time. Where I think, and, and Caleb might know more about this than I do, but where I think orthodoxy has historically had a problem with the way post-millennialism is usually expressed in the West is in the idea of post-millennialism as being sort of... Um, tied to a reconstructionism and b the idea that 
like Woodrow Wilson believed that, you know, we needed to overthrow monarchies and do all these things because if you give power to the people and then through missionary activities convert all those people to Christianity, then you'll have this ideal utopia. And the reality is that these sort of anti-monarchist ideas go against what the Bible teaches about uh, Christianity. I, I have no, I yeah, have no I, problem I agree. With... I don't think that postmillennialism necessarily conflicts with monarchism, by the way. I think no, that, not, uh, at all. It, not at all. Yeah, I, right. I don't think so. Yeah. So I don't yeah. have a problem with postmillennialism no. or even Christian reconstructionism if you want to establish actually Christian society. My problem is that at least the way that it's usually presented, you have the Antichrist model of society being touted as if it's right. a Christian society. And that's right. what, historically speaking, I think orthodoxy has really and, had a problem with. Yeah, and, and the, I, have seen, I, I haven't really seen too many debates on this, like, on uh, in terms of, like, orthodoxy's perspective on postmillennialism. I, I don't think I've seen too many people talking about it. So, no, Caleb, and, 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 Caleb, go ahead, and I, I want to hear what you yeah, have to say about this. The, the one, two cents that I'll add to that is, no, if you want to have a positive outlook on eschatology, then great. Um, you should. I mean, I, I hope and pray that someday we get another <laughs> Russian czar. I hope and pray mm -hmm. that we, that, you know, that Putin, once he wins this war, that he reestablishes the the monarch family you know whoever was next in line and then russia becomes a true christian monarchy again and becomes a light to the world um is that going to happen oh, that happens i'm moving to russia bro <laughs> uh, yeah yeah same, same and uh but you know i would love for that to happen and so but you know but the thing is that i see is like for example in the american colonies the puritans had their own version of post-millennialism and they use that to do just awful things like right. they they murdered and genocidally wiped out a lot of tribes on the east coast of america i mean even like cotton mouther wrote about and like bragged about how his christian soldiers barbecued men women and children their captains oh my gosh, their that's terrible. yeah they use that word barbecued yeah and the uh the captain of the guard who led in this battle in the pequot war said that yeah we killed the men the women and the children we burned them inside their huts and he's like, this may seem cruel, but David and, and Joshua had murdered children, so that's okay. I mean, so of course didn't, they don't. Wait, the wait, wait. Didn't the didn't the Puritans also start the Salem witch trials as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, and furthermore, is this sort of leaked into American society? This right. idea of post their puritanical understanding of postmillennialism, the manifest destiny thing. So the push westward, where. You know, we are, you know, the Americans basically annihilated the Plains tribes of the Indians, the Sioux and the Kiowa and the, you know, the Cherokee and the, the even the Cherokee and the Algonquin tribes. That was all justified by saying America was given to uh, white European settlers by God. And because the natives don't farm the land and because they're they have no eye concept of owning land and because they're a bunch of pagans. It is our destiny and our right to go in and take the land from them and to possess it and to convert them to Christianity by force. And that's what we're really against is that idea. Um, and now, like I said, that's not all post-millennial views. Like I think N.T. Wright's view of eschatology is quite good. Um, it's actually, what is his it's view of eschatology? Perfect. He has a very positive post-millennial idea. Um, he wouldn't call it post-millennialism, but if you ever read like some of his books, um, I can't remember the name of his book on eschatology, but uh, anyway, it's really good. It's really good. You ought to read it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, if you want to have a positive view of when Christ comes back, yeah, bring it on. I would love it. Yeah, I, I don't agree with the Catholic Church's stance that like, oh, you must be a millennial or else like, you know, you're not yeah. Yeah. Catholic I think, or something. Like. I, think, uh, I think orthodoxy marries kind of the best of both of all the worlds really i think this is where you can see how everybody broke off from orthodoxy so clearly is that you have uh yeah we have the very heavily symbolic reading of revelation which is what you see in amillennialism we have the very positive attitude that the church will triumph that the post-millennialists have right. and then we have the very historic um 
historic literalist sort of idea that there will be a final antichrist That's there right. will be a physical time of persecution etc right. right does this um, also include like a physical rebuilt temple because i've heard orthodox folks no. talk about that no you no. you won't have a rebuilt no. so part of the problem with dispensationalism is not only that they believe that there will be a rebuilt temple but that they believe that um sacrifices will be reinstituted to, right sacrifices stuff, yeah. will be reinstituted and they see that as a good thing because they see uh israel as still being the people right. of god so the jews in israel right. as still being the people of god whereas we see the church as israel so the church mm -hmm. is the true israel and we won't go back to sacrificing animals because we have the ones who Not are all atonement, sacrificing no. christ exactly yeah um and, now we so do have sacrifices of things right like we do right, have sacrifices of things but Right, the Eucharist, the incense, and even Paul in the book of Acts, he has the uh, guys at the after their Nazarite vow actually That's right. sacrifice a dove, like <laughs> a blood Wait, sacrifice. But yeah, go read the book of Acts. Father Stephen the Young actually talked about this in his uh, Lord of Spirits podcast episode on Samson. Paul and, and several of his followers take a Nazarite vow, which is why he shaves his head for a temporary mm -hmm. time. And so you could be a Nazarite for a short time if you want to. It doesn't have to be permanent. And after their time was fulfilled, he goes back to Jerusalem to offer the proper sacrifice, of the thanks offering sacrifice at the temple along with the others. And he thinks nothing of it. It's just like, right. yeah, you know, we're, we're done. It's time to offer our, our food thank offering, which offering an animal is all can can be a thank offering and not an atonement offering if you're offering it as a food sacrifice. Right. Um, so. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with even that. Uh, it's when yeah, you begin doing what the Jews do, where you exactly. take the blood, you fling it on the Holy of Holies, and you fling it on the people to cover their sin. So there's different types right. of sacrifice, you know. And yeah. so the the reinstitution of the temple, I mean, I'm not going to rule out the possibility that the Jews might create a third temple i really don't a blasphemous care. one yeah right exactly but that would be definitionally antichrist because mm -hmm. they're not christians yeah they're so they're outside of the true israel of god they can call themselves israel if they want to but they're outside of the true israel of god um so n no we wouldn't see that and by the way uh just as an assistant since caleb yeah. brought it up uh, since Caleb brought it up, History and Eschatology is the book by N.T. Wright. There it is. There um, it is. Oh, okay. Very good book. Um, I just looked okay, that up. Okay, I'll probably have to check that out. I was reading um, uh, He Shall Have Dominion by Kenneth Gentry. That is kind of where I'm going with postmillennialism. Like, that's essentially He's like the bad. basis for my yeah. uh, postmillennialism is Kenneth Ken Gentry. Uh, David Chilton, Days of Vengeance, I have that. Um, mm hmm He's pretty good. Um, He's not even, bad for a Presbyterian, I'll say yeah. that. <laughs> even R.J. Rush Dooney is actually pretty good in a lot of ways. Um, although, when you start getting into Rush Dooney and Bonson and all you guys of are those racist. guys... <laughs> yeah. Oh, Rush Dooney's <laughs> a racist? Um, oh, Rush Dooney is a racist, bro. He's a kinist. I'm friends He's with Mark, Mark Rush Dooney on Facebook. <laughs> they'll, they'll probably deny it, but I could pull up some YouTube audios of where he talks about clearly not ra marrying outside of your race and stuff. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I'm a sinner then. <laughs> oh um, yeah. But, yeah. uh, you dirty but, sinner. And, what's that? <laughs> I said you dirty sinner marrying That's outside right. your race. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, when you get into, especially Van Til, Van Til actually had a really bizarre view of the Trinity, wherein he believed that the uh basically so he believes that you have the father son and holy spirit and then you have sort of a fourth entity the that divine is, essence right the divine essence is actually another view. person that's calvin's oh, really? view really yeah. That was yeah yeah it's called egalitarian trinitarianism so you have sort of these three Maybe we should do a podcast on this next time, Maybe Kevin. We should. Um, but there's three sort of heretical Trinitarian positions that are believed by a lot of Protestants. And the reason why they have to do these things is because of the filioque. 
but right. uh, but egalitarian. What does the Filioque have to do with uh, you know erroneous ideas like a, a fourth member of the Trinity? Like, Be, okay, because and this is the short. I don't want to give away the podcast, but uh, sure. Um, so basically, if you don't have a Filioque, you you subscribe to what is the the monarchy of the Father, right? Where yeah. the Father alone is is autotheos his you know the son and the spirit share in his divine nature but they don't generate it in themselves the father shares it to them it's what saint irenaeus said about the, the son and the spirit of the two hands of the trinity so we don't have these sort of problems because of that and in the west they don't really now catholics will say they see the father as the fountainhead of divinity a lot of them do but it doesn't make sense for had to have a filioque if you do that but because the uh, in Protestant circles, they have to sort of figure out because if you have the spirit being generated equally by the father and the son uh, being proceeding out of, that causes a problem because you've got the Holy Spirit originating from two different sources. So it's, right. is it like, is he like Voltron where two halves come together and form the whole, you know, it, it gets really complicated. <laughs> and so you have egalitarian, egalitarian Trinitarianism, which basically says that there's this quote fourth person of the Trinity and it's the divine essence shared by all the three. And so therefore all of them are autotheos simultaneously. And then you have, uh, but then that sort of flatlines the difference. Yeah, but the wouldn't, wouldn't that mean that they're all separate gods at that point? If yeah. They're yeah. All yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It go it goes to, it, it really bleeds into tritheism. Then you've got sort of the social Trinity. And this is the idea that you. Yeah. Mormons believe this, in social Trinitarianism. Right. This is the idea that you only have distinctions in the person defined by who they relate to. So if uh, so, yeah, that one's confusing. And then you have the relative identity Trinitarianism. I'd really have to brush up on these. But basically, these are all philosophical attempts to rescue a Trinitarian doctrine without the filioque. And right. uh, Dr. Bro Branson has done a lot of work on this. Um, the uh, and uh, yeah, and, and it's a really sad situation to see because orthodoxy's exactly. had the answer for years and the west believed this you know believed in the monarchy of the father for years until the filioque was inserted into the creed but right and yeah. like, i actually was doing a quick survey of scripture and i was like uh yeah it's right first corinthians 8 6 first corinthians 11 uh 11 6 mm -hmm. jesus says you know i'm going to my god and to your god and like Mm -hmm. Paul says, you know, uh, the head of Christ is God. And then Paul says, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we, we worship one God, the Father, and then one Lord, Jesus Christ. So, so, yeah, I mean, like, but like when I talk to Protestants and Calvinists, they usually just had, give me head scratching answers. Like, well, that means like something that it does. Well, well that just means that like uh, that, that like yeah. God, the Father is just like. You know the uh, they don't say monarchy the the monarchy they say well God the Father is just kind of like the primary member uh, he's the primary of the Godhead like he's he's the, the chief uh, he, architect yeah. basically yeah yeah and see they'll they'll they're getting towards the monarchy of the Father but because they'll insist on the filioque they can't go all the way with it but um, yeah well Kevin brother I really need to go but. All right. Brother, it's been a it's been a fantastic time. I always enjoy doing these things with you, but Absolutely. let's do it again sometime and maybe we'll do one on the uh Western Trinitarian heresies. That would yes, be fun. Yes, absolutely. Oh, do, and then uh, maybe do, do, uh, well. do an actual like expose on Calvinism. I want to see it. We've actually sure. done some stuff on Calvinism already. We did a QA we'll show send you that. on that. So I'll yeah, send, we'll you, send that. you that. And yeah, uh oh, yeah, and if you still yeah. have questions after that, we can do another show. And uh, maybe even bring you on and have you at grill us a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was a former Calvinist, so I could probably rail you guys a little bit. Okay. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, I'm a former Calvinist yeah. as well. Recovering. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin, and I'm a recovering Calvinist. I'm a recovering <laughs> Calvinist. <yeah. laughs> All right. God All right. bless you guys. Have a great one. All right. You Bye, too. Guys.